When I was 12 years old, I wrote a letter to NASA. It went roughly like this. Dear NASA, I heard you are planning to send humans to Mars in about 30 years, and I have a great idea for you. Why don't you choose a group of children so that you can train them to be exactly the type of astronauts that you need for this mission? I'd say a group of 12-year-olds will be the perfect candidates for this. As it happens, I am an extraordinary 12-year-old who would love to participate in this mission. Sincerely, David Zamborski. P.S. Maybe I could be the commander. <laughs> One idea that ran through this letter sticks out in my mind. That thought is that astronauts are simply born to do the great things and be the amazing people that they are. Being an astronaut, like having blue eyes, that's just who they are. As a project for my grade 12 English class, I wrote biographies for all of Canada's astronauts. They all have multiple degrees, were accomplished pilots, doctors, and scientists. Every one of them had a list of awards and accomplishments a mile long. They seemed superhuman. But over the years, a great example of this was Chris Hadfield. He graduated from the Royal Military College in Kingston. He became a fighter pilot, graduating at the top of his class. As a test pilot, he flew brand new aircraft on a regular basis, constantly pushing the boundaries of flight. Then he became an astronaut and flew on the space shuttle. It seemed to me that he was born an amazing person and success followed him. But over the years, something began to change in how I viewed astronauts. Certainly, they're still extraordinary people. Look at Mark Kelly. During Operation Desert Storm, he flew 38 combat missions. He's flown over 5,000 hours on over 50 different types of aircraft. He's flown on the space shuttle four times, twice as commander. Mark Kelly seems to embody an amazing person who was born gifted and used that to fulfill his dreams. Even his genes support this. His brother, Scott Kelly, his identical twin is also an astronaut. He's flown twice on the space shuttle and was commander of the International Space Station. He's flown 180 days in space compared to 54 days for Mark. But Mark Kelly isn't just a pilot or an astronaut. He's not even just a brother. He's a husband. He married a U.S. Congresswoman. Her name is Gabrielle Giffords. On January 8, 2011, Gabby was shot in Tucson, Arizona. Mark Kelly left Houston to be at his wife's side. On his way, he was handed a false report stating that she had died, and he broke down but she was still alive. And Mark Kelly was at her, at her side to help her recover. At the time of this incident, Mark Kelly was preparing to be a, a commander of, the, of a shuttle mission to the International Space Station. He didn't know if he could go into space another time. Understandably, NASA was anxious for his decision but it was only due to Gabby's remarkable recovery and her support that he decided to go to space for his fourth and final shuttle mission. 
Why do astronauts take such great risks? Space advocates are constantly asking the question, why? Why spend money? Why take the risk? Why should we even care about space? Most answers are generic. We do it to stimulate the economy. We do it for technology. We do it for the spin-offs. But why would Mark Kelly leave his wife months after such a horrible incident? Astronauts aren't just extraordinary men and women. They are human beings who share the same hopes, dreams, and fears as you and I. Chris Hadfield is a musician, as many of you know from watching his viral video. But did you know he also played guitar on a previous shuttle mission? His crew and the crew on the International Space Station had a sing-along just before they undocked. Tracy Caldwell Dyson has flown on the space shuttle and was a crew member of the International Space Station. She's flown 176 days in space. But she is also a dreamer. This is a picture of her watching silently over the Earth. I don't know what she's thinking, but I can hazard a guess. Nearly every astronaut has reported a changed perspective from their time in space. This is called the overview effect. When you see the Earth as it really is, a small, rocky body around an average star, you realize we're all on the, same, on the same spaceship. Spaceship Earth. We all live in that thin atmosphere on that small planet, and the borders that separate us on maps disappear when viewed from space. The problems we face today are increasingly global problems, like climate change. I, for one, would like to see a more global perspective from politicians of all stripes. So far, 539 people have been to space, but that number is about to take a giant leap forward. Virgin Galactic has sold over 700 tickets for flights to space that should begin later this year. I think it's helpful to look at who the next generation of astronauts will be. It's not a generation of professional astronauts, but individuals who will be going purely for the experience. One of the first of this new generation of astronaut happens to be one of the most unlikely. Stephen Hawking is perhaps the world's most renowned cosmologist. But at the age of 21, he was diagnosed with ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, and told he had two years to live. Despite being nearly paralyzed by his disability and only being able to communicate through a computer-generated voice, Hawking has probed the vast reaches of the universe. But despite his incredible achievements in cosmology, he seemed trapped by his body. He wouldn't have been selected to be a professional astronaut. But the new age of space tourism has given him a chance to go to space. In 2007, Hawking participated in a zero-gravity flight. This is an aircraft that flies in giant arcs to give its passengers the experience of weightlessness for about 30 seconds. It's planned that Stephen Hawking will be a passenger on one of the first commercial space flights by Virgin Galactic. Space tourism has been called joy rides for rich people, but I couldn't disagree more. While professional astronauts are extraordinary men and women, they aren't the only people capable of going to space. 
Now is the time when we need all of humanity to join in this great adventure. Certainly, we will need engineers and scientists, but we also need artists and musicians and writers as well. There are many questions that need answers, and they don't all involve the nuts and bolts of spaceflight. What kind of painting do you put in a space hotel when there's no direction for up? How do you write the words to describe the fragile beauty of the Earth or the countless stars visible when you look at that deep darkness? What kind of music do you play on a lunar elevator? An elevator that stretches 55,000 kilometers from the surface of the moon. At 100 kilometers an hour, that's a 23-day trip. That's a lot of elevator music. I believe we will become a multi-planet civilization, and that will challenge us. How will we relate to someone living on Mars? How will we communicate when there's a 20-minute delay in communication? If something goes wrong, we won't even know what's happening. But these challenges will make us better as a society just like a runner who pushes past their wall while running a marathon. A great example of this is Elon Musk, who was born in South Africa to a Canadian mother. He saw three great forces that would shape humanity, space, energy, and the internet. Since the first two forces involved a great deal of money and he didn't have any, he decided to co-found an internet company called Zip2. He rented an office and slept on the floor to save money on rent. And he showered at the local gym. Hardly an extraordinary beginning. But his determination paid off. He sold Zip2 to make several million dollars, then next co-founded and sold PayPal to make sev several times that. At this point, he had a choice. He could have retired, or as he said, he could have bought a chain of islands and sipped Mai Tais on a beach. But instead, Elon decided to co-found Tesla Motors and SpaceX to tackle the other great forces of our time. SpaceX has become one of the most innovative space companies. They're delivering cargo to the International Space Station with their Dragon capsule, and they will soon have a manned version with a sleek and modern design. But it is their long-term goal that is the most inspiring. SpaceX wants to establish a human settlement on Mars, and Elon Musk won't sell share public shares of SpaceX until that goal is met. When I was 12, I wrote a letter to NASA. If I wrote a letter today, it wouldn't be to NASA. It would be to each and every one of you. And it would go roughly like this. I heard there are plans to go to Mars in about 30 years and I have a great idea for you. Why don't you choose to be extraordinary so you can participate in this, in this great adventure? You could be the artist who creates the painting that hangs on the habitat wall, or the craftsperson who builds a guitar light enough to make the voyage. Maybe it's that guitar that keeps the crew from despair on their long journey. All you need to do is seize that choice and be extraordinary. Sincerely, David Samborski. P.S. Maybe you could be the commander. Thank you. <laughs>